turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 18. We're continuing through our series in Matthew. As you're turning there, it's worth noting that part of what holds the whole Gospel of Matthew together are these discourses, something that's distinctive about Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Throughout the 28 chapters of Matthew, there are five lengthier discourses that Jesus gives. It is something distinct here in Matthew. And the fourth begins here in chapter 18. It runs from chapter 18 through chapter uh, 20 and focuses on this theme of uh, community life. Now, if your Bible is is like mine, uh, as you look at these 14 verses, which we will consider together, at uh, the top of three places there are headings, subject headings, the top of verse 1, verse uh, 7, and verse 10. Oftentimes these are helpful. These are not inspired uh, from the Lord. Um, We have provided these. Man has provided these to help uh, categorize subjects in in the text. Most of the time they are helpful. Here I would suggest that they can be misleading. You can read these 14 verses and perhaps be led to think that these are three uh, distinct categories or subject matters. But what we will see, I hope, is that there is a common thread that not only runs through these first 14 verses, but all the way through this chapter, chapter 18, which is community life and the kinds of people, the kind of society that Jesus is seeking to form uh, as his church. And so listen now to God's word, Matthew 18, 1 through 14. At that time, uh, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray... Does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father, who is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Well, back in chapter uh, 16... If you recall, for the first time, Jesus began speaking about this community, the society that he is going to set apart and build. He made that promise in those important five words. I will build my church. He began to speak of the church for the first time. From that point in chapter 16, we begin to see the focus of Jesus' ministry uh, begin to narrow. From ministering to the crowds teaching the larger crowds, feeding the masses and the feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000, healing people from the crowds, to really zeroing in more and more on the kinds of people and the characteristics that are going to define his church, his society, the people of God. And that's exactly what we begin to see here in chapter 18. And as we consider the subject of Christ's community and the church... And his focus on it. I want to to begin with a very simple point that I think might help explain and help us understand what Jesus is communicating to his people, not only here in the first half of chapter 18, but uh, further on, as we'll consider next week. And that simple point is that who I am determines 
uh, the kinds of friends I will make. Who I am, who we are, determines the kind of community to whom we will belong or associate with. Uh, To say it a little bit more abstractly, we could simply say identity or self-perception determines community. And this principle is worked out in very practical ways in everyday life. I think teachers probably see it as clearly as anybody at the beginning of every new school year. Those first days and first weeks as children make their way out at recess and the playground or young people gather at around tables at lunchtime in the lunchroom, uh, you see perhaps a student, a young person, unsure of their own identity and they begin to survey the different groups that exist out at recess, out at recess in the playground or at the lunchroom. And they're wondering, to whom do I belong? Where do I uh, fit in? What group should I go participate uh, in? Should I go join the conformists or the rebels? Right? Is it going to be the bookworms or the bullies? The jocks and the athletes or the geeks, possibly? Who will it be? And the group to whom they go choose to associate with, you know, reveals something about how they see themselves. And that's true of every one of us here in this community. Your participation in this community reveals something about how you perceive yourself, what you value, who you are. And this is the same principle is very true in the life of every particular church. How the church sees itself determines the kind of community, in great part, it's going to be. If a church sees itself as a kind of hospital, a care center. It's going to tend to value the ministry of mercy and compassion and care for others, helping others. If it sees itself as a kind of missionary outpost, it's going to tend to value evangelism and conversion of the lost. If it sees itself as an academy, a place of learning, that community is going to value doctrine and teaching in the place of the mind. Now, we might say all three of those are important parts of church life and church ministry, but what we see here in this text is Jesus zero in on one particular characteristic that he wants his people, his society, to be defined by. It's a remarkable passage. And that characteristic we see come in response to a question that Jesus has asked in the first verse. What do they ask? The disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's the question that's going to lead Jesus to communicate this central characteristic of the people of God, certainly in this particular passage in context. Who's the greatest? Now, at first glance, we might wonder, why are the disciples asking this question about who is the greatest? Isn't it enough that they're called as one of his own, one of his disciples? Why the question about status and position? Yeah, we might recall back in chapter 5, Verse 19, Jesus has already spoken about greater and lesser people in his kingdom. He said, whoever relaxes on my commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom. And whoever does them and teaches others the same will be called great in the kingdom. And remember, it's a kingdom. Kingdoms have authority structures, orders, hierarchy, Authority. In the next chapter, chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus will say, In the new world, at the consummation of the kingdom, some are going to sit on thrones, ruling in the kingdom. Not only that, we've seen Jesus give particular emphasis to some of his apostles over the others. He's pulled Peter, James, and John away. We saw in the last chapter, up the Mount of Transfiguration. It was they, not the others, who had the wonderful privilege of seeing Jesus transformed, transfigured before their eyes. So it's not that surprising that they're asking about greatness. It's really a question about position and status. What will get me status? And I think it is a question that continues today. People, Christians, non-Christians, very much can be motivated by status. We may not be cognizant of it, but it's in us. What is my position with the king? What is my status in this kingdom? Where is my place in relation to others in this kingdom? 
Uh, People can seek status by the kind of home they live in, the kind of education that they've obtained, the authors they read, the children that they've raised, the position that they hold at work, the amount of money they have. These are all ways that uh, we can seek for status. Notice Jesus does not say that you shall not be great. That's not his response to their question. He doesn't say you shall not seek to be great. What does he do? He defines greatness by using a living illustration. He brings a child in front of the disciples and in front of the other people gathered. In Mark's account, we're told that he's in the house. Presumably, most likely, he's in Capernaum. He's in the house that he would stay in most regularly during his earthly ministry. And we're told from Mark that the disciples are actually arguing there about who is the greatest. And he takes a child. Mark adds that he takes a child up in his arms. Elsewhere, the child is uh, standing before the disciples and before those in the house. So he takes this child, sets it before them. We don't know the age of this child, and we actually don't know whether it's a boy or girl. But what he says is, unless you turn, that's what he says, unless you turn, unless you do a 180 degree turn in your attitude and become like little children, become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Forget about who's the greatest. You won't even make it in if you do not become like children. You won't even get through the front door. But, verse 4, if you become like a child, if you become like a kid, you'll have great, substantial status. And that's what he says. So the important question, of course, is what does Jesus mean by child or by children? We see child, we see children, we see little ones elsewhere in this passage. Well, some have suggested that what Jesus means is becoming innocent. Innocent. Like a child. Are children innocent? Yeah, I heard some chuckles. This actually reminds me of an article I read some time ago. Uh, It contained a police report. Two law, law enforcement officers down in Tennessee Uh, went to the home of a suspected shoplifter, a teenager. They knocked on the door. The teenager's mother and older sister came to the door. Uh, When the officers asked if the young man was there, both the mother and sister said, no, he's not here. We don't know where he is, but he's not here. As they were saying those very words, uh, about a two-year-old toddler came running up and said, oh, yeah, he's here. He's back in the closet hiding. Now, what's interesting is that in that article, the police report came, and the officer in that report wrote these words. This shows how children that age can only, te- can only tell the truth, and that is wonderful. <laughs> that is obviously an officer who does not have his own children and probably has never been around children. But No, children are not merely innocent, except, except ours, of course. Uh, What about the idea, which is suggested as well by some, that children are trusting? They may be. They may not be. One commentator put it this way. Children are untempted to self-advancement. Really? One man wrote in his autobiography, I have never lost the childlike humility that characterizes all great men. Wow. (laughs) It seems to me what what Jesus has in mind uh, by referring to child or becoming like children is not a subjective virtue. It's not something like innocence or being trusting or unselfishness. He asked a question about position. Uh, They asked a question about position and status. Jesus gives them an answer about position and status. It's not something subjective that a child brings. It is their objective status and position. A child is not looked up to. A child is looked after. Particularly in Jesus' day, children had a very low, even despised, and I think that would be a key word to 
to, to define children in that day, a despised status. Weak, vulnerable, needy. And saying you must turn and become like children is to say you must become basically a nobody. A nobody. You must enter the kingdom with nothing. It's the only way into this kingdom. No gift that you possess, no, pos- no possession, no degree, no rank in society, no amount of wealth or is going to contribute to your status in this kingdom. In a sense, you have to leave all that at the door. That's how you come. A low status. Is that how we see ourselves in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ? What's striking in this passage, and quite curious, I think, at first glance, is how Jesus applies this characteristic, this humility, to his disciples, beginning in verse 5. Verses 1 and 4 addresses the necessity of becoming like a child. Someone weak, low status, if you want to say a nobody. To verse 5, welcoming the nobody. He says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Why does Jesus suddenly switch uh, from becoming like children ourselves, someone of low status, to welcoming and receiving such children? I wrestled over this in this text. But perhaps, perhaps the answer is this. And it has everything to do with community life. Only when I humble myself and become of low status, only when I understand that my accomplishments and my education or my occupation or my possessions or intellect contribute nothing to my status in the kingdom, only when I have that self-perception am I really able to effectively receive other people in this kingdom. Weak and needy and lowly people. You remember back in chapter 11 when John the Baptist was in prison, he sent word out to his disciples and he asked, uh, is this the one who is to come or should we look for another? And what is Jesus' word back? Jesus says, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind, those of low status, receive sight. The lame, low status, walk. Lepers, low status, are cleansed. The poor, low status, have good news preached to them. And then he says, blessed is the one not offended by me. In other words, I am lowly, I'm the rejected one, I'm the despised one, and I welcome those despised. So following the despised one means welcoming the lowly and despised. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said this, When I preach, I let myself down to the lowest. I don't see the doctors, that would be the PhDs in Luther's day, or the magistrates, civil office holders, of whom there are about 40. But I look at the crowd of young people, the children, the servants, who are in hundreds or thousands. To them I preach and direct my words, for they have need of my words. If the others do not wish to listen to me, the door stands open. He's saying if the pure and simple gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ's conquering sin and death, freeing people from the pit and chains of sin, if that is not of interest, the door stands open. And Jesus, if you look at verses 5 through 9, is really driving at the heart of what would define this community and society. And it's all about receiving and helping one another purge sin by the grace of God. Jesus makes no bones about it. Sin takes center stage in his teaching here. He gets to the core issue that affects the community and community life. Look at verse 6. Here, he is warning about causing others to sin. 
He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better to have a millstone hung around your neck and be drowned in the sea. That's a way of saying this is critical. This is really important. And we might not think that the words we say, the actions we uh, take, or the interactions that we have can cause uh, stumbling. It's easy to have in our society a mindset of simply, as long as I keep to myself, it will, it will not have an effect on other people. But Jesus is heightening the value of the community. He's heightening the value of every single one in this community. Now, that word, you may have seen already, takes really a special focus, the word one, throughout these verses. Verse 5, whoever receives one such child. Verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones to sin. Verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Verse 12, the shepherd goes after the one strange sheep. Every one in the community is significant, and your relation and my relation to the community matters. It has an effect. So he's warning about causing other people to stumble and sin. But then notice what he does. He calls every person to purge sin in their own life because of its potential effect on the community. If an individual member is spiritually sick, it affects the community. And so we're called to mortify sin, to cut sin off. So he says in verse 8, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Or your, right, or your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. And of course, Jesus is using hyperbole here, which is not only stressing the seriousness of sin, but he's bringing the whole subject of sin front and center. And I think this is where Christ's society, where the church is absolutely distinguished from every other kind of group or community. Jesus is not interested in making us simply feel better about ourselves. He goes right to the point of our trouble, which is sin, and he puts his finger there. Sin will separate people from God. Sin will cause division among brothers. Sin will create guilt and shame. Next week, we will address how to respond when someone sins against us. But these verses are about helping one another fight sin. How do you cut off sin, or gouge out sin. I think whether it's dealing with our own sin or helping others fight the good fight of the faith, cutting sin off in their lives, removing sin, purging sin, mortifying sin can be a little bit like removing splinters from the body. Now, I know a little bit about this with three young children, okay, removing splinters. You first have to identify it. You first have to be able to name that you have sin. Not just sin in general, but particular sins. You can't cut off what you don't identify. So you have to first identify it. So it takes attention, it takes care. Sometimes the splinter is very deep, well beneath the skin. It's, it's taken a root, it has hold. We can't even see it, perhaps. And it takes more than tweezers. It, and this happens. You got to get the needle out. You got to get the needle out. But you know what will not remove sin is a mirror or a magnifying glass. Sometimes they're necessary. I think sometimes sin in our own lives or in the lives of others is treated with a mirror which would be likened to God's commandments. God's commandments expose our sin. God's commandments, Paul said in Romans 7, are good. They're glorious. This is the path of life. This is the path of holiness. But the commandments of God will never be able to remove sin from your life. They show you the path of holiness. Uh, they can crush your heart and show you your wickedness and misery and sin. But the commandment cannot remove sin from you. You need something more than the commandment. 
You need the pardoning grace. You need the, the ointment of God's grace placed upon you. That's what we need. Th- that's what we need to do for one another. We need to know what is the gospel. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves. To know again and again of Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. That there's not only the forgiveness of sin, but the, 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 the Holy Spirit to help us mortify that sin in our lives, the particular sins, as he grows us in sanctification. And we need to know about this shepherd, as we see in the last verses, this shepherd who will leave the 99 and will not stop going after the one who is straying. That's a hopeful message for any of us. When you're in the path of the Christian life, Your shepherd has you. He continues to go after you because he wants for you and me a holy life, a life resting in his goodness and grace. That's the one to whom we are to point one another to. He leaves the 99. He goes after the one. We see our Lord. He's elevating the value and the worth of every one sheep and his willingness to go to tremendous lengths to redeem, to bring back, to minister And we are called, we are privileged to participate in that kind of community where we encourage, we exhort, we love one another toward the shepherd as we walk this path of sanctification and life uh, together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the clarity with which you address sin. Uh, Sin which for all of us troubles us at varying levels at times in our lives. We thank you Yet, Lord, for the gospel of your Son, that your Son, Jesus, died on the cross to pay the price to bear our guilt in our place. Lord, may this truth and reality be be ours. May we, we know it. May we live by it. Lord, may we move toward one another, encouraging and exhorting one another in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, continue to form us together as we uh, seek to be the kind of society and community, the kind of church that you desire us to be, resting in your word, loving your commandments, but knowing that we rest upon your grace, something that is outside of us, but which we receive. And Lord, may we glorify and exalt you as you do that work in and through us. And we pray all this uh, through Christ our Lord. Amen.